So you're um, you get a bit of a bash on this. So um, <laughs> I think I think the objective of this is is to give a bit of a wider understanding on condensation of mold. Um, I'll talk a little bit about why it happens, when it happens, um, and I think that <coughs> there's a lot of misinformation out there. Um, this is all we do, so I like to think that uh, we've got a good approach and we've we've got a good view of everything. So I think. Everybody could learn a little bit more about it. The fact that we're all sat here is, is a good thing. Um, it, it means that everyone wants to learn a little bit more. Um, I think from a tenant point of view, they obviously need to learn a little bit more about this. I think we've established that across the people that have spoken so far. But I also see, um, I've done about 4,000, I'm just getting redirected. Um, I've done about 4,000 surveys for condensation and mould, and I've seen just as many landlords that have got misinformation as tenants that have got misinformation. So. I'll, I'll start to get through. So um, if for, you, for those of you that don't know, um, Envirovent, we specialize in condensation and mold. So we do nothing to do with rising damp, penetrating damp, wet rot, dry rot. We know nothing about all that stuff. We leave that to everybody else. So I like to think that by focusing on one thing, we become an expert in it. And I think across the company, the level of training that goes into this, it's a very small niche uh, and it can, it can get quite complicated. So. We, I'm not going to go into the, the intricacies of the company. Um, this is a presentation that is um, not mine, so it'll be a surprise for you and for me, which is quite good. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about the problems. So there's some key metrics here, and uh, Bruce gave some good advice, and we talked a little bit about the, the hygrometers. So a hygrometer is something that will measure relative humidity, and the magic number for us is here, 60%. So 60%, if there's one thing you take away from this presentation, Sorry, I'm wondering. Um, if there's one thing you take away from this, remember this, 60% relative humidity. At this level of relative humidity, you are not gonna get any problems with condensation of mold. Mold is a fungus, which is a type of plant. It needs water to grow. If you don't water your flowers that you all buy your wives, they aren't gonna grow. Um, that's the best way to kill something. So this is the magic number, and there's a lot of variables that go into this. You'll notice that when you measure this with your fancy hygrometers, it'll say RH, which is relative humidity, and that's the humidity that has the relationship with the temperature. So we'll go a little bit more into, into depth with that. There's been a lot of talk about heating and level of heat in the property. That's really important. For every one degree drop in temperature, humidity will go up by 5%, which is quite important to remember because all your tenants are turning it down slightly, so it's making it slightly worse. Um, and apparently one in five homes in the UK will suffer with a condensation and mould problem. That's getting a little bit closer to one in four and we expect that to increase as, as some of the variables increase when it comes to things like insulation and it comes to the, the price of heating homes as well. So we'll get into the, the crux of it. So some of you are probably looking at it thinking, how have they got a picture of my tenant? Um, this is how they complain. So generally what we find is that they leave it and leave it and leave it and leave it and then there seems to be a build up and then everything gets taken out on us or the letting agency if there's the, and there's a few letting agencies here and the la i mean the, the tenant will blame the landlord the landlord will blame the tenant and then the letting agency will blame both of them to each other um, <laughs> that tends to be <laughs> um, i'm joking <laughs> So um, as the, as a little example here as well, um, there's a little bit of cold bridging on there. I'm going to go into that in a bit more detail so that we've got an ability to diagnose some of the problems. Um, but I think taking it from this, this is the first that we hear about it. So it's important to listen to the information that we're getting from them while they're shouting at us. Um, and I keep saying those, I've been a landlord for 10 years, so I get to see this from both sides. Um, if you speak to anybody at Envirovent, they believe that the second this happens, you should ring us. I don't believe that. I think there's a process that you should follow. And I get to go to some properties as a landlord, and I get to go to some properties looking for a solution for condensation and mould. And the approach that I get from the tenant is completely different. Um, but again, we'll go, we can go into that in a bit more detail. Um, I've put a bit of a light-hearted spin on this. I hear some funny things when it comes to... Um, when it comes to condensation and mold, but it's it's all around misdiagnosis and it's all around um, it's all, it's all around I suppose not having a full understanding of the problem. So um, for those of you that don't know, rising damp doesn't go that high. Um, if somebody's above 
ground floor, generally speaking, they're not going to have a problem with rising damp. Um, this was one from actually literally two weeks ago. Um, the tenant has stopped paying the rent and they believe that since that point in time, they've started to get more than the bathroom. So they think the landlord's doing it too. So we get Probably Amazon. Um, I think uh, the, the, the next one was um, uh, Tyneside Flat. Um, this was a student. Um, the student's grandma said that if they run a hot bath and shut the door, keep all the steam in for as long as possible, make sure it's, they, they can't literally see their hand in front of the face, and then they open the door, the steam will heat the kitchen. Um, they were both jet black. So. Um, again, I think that there's, there's a lot of education out there. We've, we've got something that I've got at the very end of this, which you can share with your tenants. The first step is to, is to help them understand what the problem is and what they could be doing to, to contribute towards it. There's something on one of our blogs, which is 14 ways to avoid condensation and mould. And before I help any of my tenants, I ask them to be doing at least eight to 10 of them, depending on how good the tenant is. But again, coming back to it, there's, there's a few different options here. Uh, sorry, a few different quotes that you're getting from, from people. Uh, make sure that they're not, they're not doing any of this stuff before, before you're looking at solutions. And uh, I think landlords are... <coughs> are not um, excluded from this as well. There's, there's a lot of misconceptions with windows being open. Windows being open seems to be the magic solution to this. Um, Environment are a 45 million pound company and if opening a window solved the condensation and mold problem, I wouldn't have a job. <laughs> so it, it's, not the, it's not the be all and end all. We can police it slightly by opening windows and, and getting little bits of ventilation into the property. But it's not the solution. Um, if your tenants cook a lot, that's up to them. If they get a lot of showers, that's up to them. When you get a new tenant, you can check things like, do they pay their rent on time? Were they tidy in their lost property? If you start asking how many showers they're having, they're probably not going to move it. <laughs> um, different tenants have different lifestyles. If you look at two tenants in isolation, so let's say that we look at uh, a, a single guy or a family, a family are going to produce a lot more water than, than somebody that's a single guy that's living on their own that's going to work and coming back. Families have loads of washing, they've got kids, they might have the heating on and off a little bit more, they might have a little bit less money. So all of those things are important to, to consider when you're looking at this problem. I'm going to leave damp because um, I'll let Rob talk about that. But uh, again, there's, there's some examples of some, some condensation here. So this is, this is probably one of the most common that we see. And you're finding corners. Corners get cold spots. They're really tough to insulate. So you get something called cold bridging, which is quite a fancy way of saying a cold spot. So if you took a, a surface temperature reading here and you took one here, it would be a little bit colder in that corner, as obvious as that sounds. Moisture will always go to the coldest surface. So if you imagine you take some milk out of the fridge, uh, whatever you take out of the fridge, whether it's a bottle of beer, something cold, it'll get condensation out really quickly. The relevance for that is that that hits something called dew point. So without getting too complicated, dew point is the temperature the surface needs to be for water to sit there. You'll normally find in most properties that glass is, is always the coldest spot, but if you've got new or relatively new double glazing, take um, some of the old school properties like Tyneside Flats, for example, where we seem to spend our lives in. Um, the bay window there, if you double glaze the um, front window with quite good double glazing, the bay becomes the next coldest spot. So then what we find is a lot of people insulate the bay because that raises the surface temperature and then the two walls become the next coldest spot. So you'll insulate those and then the two corners become the next coldest spot. And if you manage to avoid dew point on all of those surfaces there, the, the clothes, the wardrobes and the belongings start to go a little bit furry. And that's because there's nowhere for the moisture to sit. So you can chase this around quite a lot in a property. There's quite a good example here of a dot and dab where there's some cold bridging, where there's some cold getting through. And a lot of people will focus on where it's going as opposed to why it's happening. If you're getting black mold in a property, it means that you are at 80% relative humidity for six hours or more. So mold needs six hours to grow and there has to be water sat there and it has to be stationary for six hours. So again, that's normally from when they go to sleep to when they wake up. That sounds too obvious, but say that to your tenant and they think you're a genius. If you go to sleep, there's no condensation. You wake up, there is condensation. 
that's evidence that temperature drops, humidity goes up, and it's finding somewhere to, to dump the coal <coughs> there, essentially. So you'll find that the cold spots, lintels, are quite common for getting problems. And you'll, you'll realise that this problem happens between September and April on outside surfaces. So all of this information that I'm giving you here, a lot of it you might know already, but some of it, when your tenant starts to describe this problem, it's like a long tick list. And as you start to go through it, you'll, you'll probably start to be able to diagnose this quite easily. Um, if it looks like this, it's definitely condensation. That's probably the easiest one to, to diagnose on there. So uh, I think the key from that is not to, to try not to chase it around. Um, a lot of people chase it around the property. We've got contracts with uh, three of the big six house builders in the UK. You would think in a brand new property, this problem doesn't exist. Partially right, it very rarely grows on outside surfaces because they don't hit that dew point, they're too warm, but everything in the side of the property tends to go a little bit furry and a little bit fluffy. So you get a bit of a mildew on it, anything leather, wood, suede, anything that's an organic material will get a little bit of a, a, a fur on it. So they're not exempt to it. Um, not gonna to spend too much time on this because it's not, it's, it's not great to talk about, but this is partially the reason um, our inquiries this year have gone up by 400% and our installations with social housing have gone up by 400% and that started in about November this year. So there was a really unfortunate story which has highlighted um, what happened um, with this. So essentially that's raised quite a lot of awareness on it. So it means that it's tenants have started to understand it a little bit better. They started to do a little bit more investigation into it and it's became part of the media. Landlords are not very nice people apparently, so we get targeted quite a lot. And this has probably highlighted that. The second one is heating. So going back to the numbers that we spoke about earlier, 60% relative humidity in a property is perfect. Now imagine some of your tenants were sitting at around 70% relative humidity. If they've dropped their heating by two degrees, which is reasonable, heating bills have started to go up. If they've dropped their, their, humid, their temperature by two degrees, what you'll find is that the humidity has gone up by 10%, which is quite a lot. So they, those problems or those properties that didn't have problems last year, and you're looking at them this year saying, why have they got a problem? It could be as subtle as this. That's also what the adverts are telling people to do. Like, yeah. School just got two degrees. Yeah, exa exactly. Degree. And, uh, some people don't have a choice, which I think um, we, we have to understand that. Some people don't have a choice with it, but for some people, they're just um, they're turning it down because they think it's the right thing to do. So having hygrometers and things around the house that measures things like temperature and humidity can, can start to help with stuff like this. Um, I know Bruce has talked about the, the ones that collect data over a long period. We've... We've asked our tenants to go, that they're a fiver from Amazon. We've asked them to buy some hygrometers because I, I'm not immune to this problem. I have tenants with condensation more problems and we'll take them through a process. We'll educate them first. And, and as a part of the education process, we'll ask them to buy a hygrometer, but it has readings on it and we educate them on those readings. So we say that you have, if, if you're at 70% relative humidity, it's too high check what your heating's on. If you can get your heating up an extra degree, watch what happens to the relative humidity. So it's working with them to help them understand it because as soon as they see the black stuff, they think it's damp, <coughs> they think it's our fault. But if we can work with them, um, for any of our tenants that work with us towards a solution, um, I'm willing to try and help them in return. But for the ones that don't, they can be quite difficult. So. This is, I suppose, a bit of an illustration as to, as to why it's happening and why it's, it's as bad as it is. People do produce water, we can't avoid that. Um, if there was nobody living in the property, you'd have no problems with condensation and mould, but you'd also have no rent. So there's a bit of a trade-off. So uh, different families will create different levels of moisture. Um, and, it, and it's exacerbated by this sort of stuff. So I'm gonna skip this slide onto this. So this is, this is probably quite important to understand. So. The perfect indoor environment is, is made up generally of these three things. So as a nation going back 30, 40, 50 years, which I can't remember, but I'm sure some of you can, um, ventilation and heating was at the front of this because somebody, somebody mentioned that earlier. Open fire in the front, open fire in the back, gaps in floorboards, gaps around windows, gaps around doors. 
but the fires produce good heat in the front and the back and, and when a fire burns it creates a negative pressure which is drawing air into the property and it's creating air changes all of the time we don't have that anymore so what we've done when this starts to get more expensive you have two options you use less or you keep more so then what we do is we get green schemes and we get uh, drives on insulation to try and seal the properties up as much as possible but when you focus on these two this one starts to suffer slightly so it's about getting a balance of all three of those things and they take it in turns and essentially it'll come around it, we're starting to get a little bit more onto this because people are becoming more aware of it um, but at the moment we're struggling here so some, some properties could do with some more insulation but it's not always the answer to solving the problem so i think that's that's probably quite a good takeaway and explaining that to the tenant it is good as well and um, if you can help them start to understand this and, and understand why it's happening you tend to get a little bit more of a buy-in from them so i'm going to talk about a couple of the solutions um, there are different things that different people will try at different stages so i think uh, i don't know why my insulation so blurry um, so insulation so the uh, cavity wall insulation loft insulation it's all brilliant for sealing heat inside the property but looking at that triangle, it has a detrimental effect on other parts of it. So if you've got a lot of insulation in the property, so let's say you've got, uh, let's take an ex-council house, for example, really well-built properties, but you seal up the cavity, you've got a 12 mm layer with a carpet, you've got uh, loft insulation in there as well, double glazing, composite front door, it becomes a sealed box. Heat can't escape as freely, but moisture can't escape either. So it's about having a bit of a balance. So EPCs are driving this, and unfortunately, this is probably going to be something that gets a little bit worse because the more we seal up, again, the better it is for heating bills, but unfortunately, the worse it is for, for things like ventilation. So I can't see this problem going backwards. Unfortunately, I can only see it going in, in one direction. Um, insulation is good, but in the right reasons. So using that tine side flat example where you've done the bare window, unless that bay window is at a seriously low temperature, it's not the right thing to do to insulate it. The best example I've got of insulation was, a, was an end terrace in Middlesbrough. It was a north facing end terrace and the landlord rendered the whole thing because he didn't believe what we were saying. He rendered the whole thing. The problem just jumped to the next coldest surface. And that's essentially what you do when you insulate a property. If you were to get cavity wall insulation on one side of the property, you'd raise all the surface temperatures there, but the other two would be cold and they, they would be kind of the areas that you would expect to get a little bit of moisture. Late comma. Um, so that's probably enough on insulation. Dehumidifiers, um, good, but try getting your tenant to use one. All they do is they Google it and they'll Google how much it will cost to run. They'll say it costs, it's a 240 kilowatts and then they'll put it into a little calculator and they'll think it costs them a thousand pound a year to run. So getting them to run it can be a tough thing, but this is a step forward and it's a really good way of showing them that that's what the problem is because you can pull a little tray out or they can pull a little tray out and it'll have loads of water in it. It's really difficult to argue with the landlord if there's a lot of water collecting because it's good evidence. Um, so these are good, but you need quite a few of them. Um, you would probably need them in the most or the worst affected areas. So, and, and unfortunately, you need them at the time when the tenant doesn't want to run them, which is from when they go to sleep to when they wake up because they're quite noisy. Uh, mold pen. So it's cheap, I suppose. Um, there's different types of mold pen. Some have got antifungal in them. Some have got um, like a warm seal in them where they, they raise surface temperature a little bit. So mold paints are good, but generally you just, you're painting over it. This is probably the cheapest of the solutions if you want to work alongside the tenant. Um, purge ventilation is quite a fancy way of saying opening your windows. This covers things like trickle vents as well. So I think to touch on this just quickly, telling your tenants to open the windows permanently does not help with this problem. There's a lot of different variables when it comes to this. So if it's really, really cold outside, what happens is the air gets in, hits the lintel, makes the lintel colder, hits the edges of the windows, makes that colder. <coughs> the, the air movement gets rid of the water off the windows, but it condenses on the sides instead. So all you do is you shift the problem slightly. So getting them to open the windows all of the time is really bad advice. Um, and we can see from going out to do these surveys, we can see that people are doing this and it's making it worse. 
A tenant would much rather have water on the windows than mould on the walls. Most of your calls about this will be about the mould, not about the water on the windows. So just something to bear in mind. If it drops below eight degrees, I don't think it's a good idea to have your windows open. And logically, if it's raining outside, <coughs> it's probably a little bit wetter outside than it is inside. And you're just swapping wet air for wet air. So opening windows is good, but with a caveat. Passive vents, same as opening windows, really. Um, we see a lot of these in front bedrooms of Tyneside flats. They just tend to make them a little bit colder in the massive rooms and they're cold anyway. So not a great, um, not a great solution. Uh, I'm not going to touch on this because it's a bit of a case study. Uh, this is a little bit about what we'll usually do to help with the problem. Um, it's about getting good quality air into the property, creating a little bit of air movement and a little bit of an air change. But um, I'm not, I'm not too bothered about talking about that. So. Um, I think we can probably move on to some questions if anybody's got any questions on this. Um, How can you know with the system you've got here? Yes. Do you have to do, uh, so you, you, you can put in it in the loft area or you have it wall hung as well? Yes. This is downstairs plan. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what else do you have to do within the property for it to work? Um, so the, the only real thing is, is things like gaps under doors. Um, so you would have to have a gap a certain... Yeah, 10 mil gap. So it, it, it can be tough in things like HMOs when you've got fire doors, you have to speak to your fire officer to see whether they want the grill or they want a, a 10 mil gap. But will the grill do the same job? As, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Um, because I kind of see the fire door of the officer allowing you to... They won't allow you. They won't allow you. Some of them do. So um, the, the thing we've found with fire officers is that I don't, is there, there's no fire officers in the room. <laughs> just checking. It's just happened when you compliment them on yeah. their consistency. Um, it's different for every area. So the advice we get in Harrogate is different to the advice that we get in Leeds. So I know in Durham they want a closable vent on the door. In Northumberland they were allowing us to do a 10 mil gap because smoke rises. Um, in Newcastle, we've had to like uh, renew fire doors because uh, the gap's too big. So in Newcastle, it's changed three times. I've done this for ten years. It's changed three times. So, so I mean, how much is the, the fire doors uh, affected so, this? Because there's, there's an obsession with fire doors in every every yeah. property now, and it just creates these boxes. Yeah. The, water, the moisture gets trapped there, and it just it can't move. But then, <laughs> what trumps what ventilation or fire safety? So I said, well, fire. <laughs> Fire safety probably trouble. I don't think the council will answer the question. To be but, fair, they, they just make things up as they go along. Yeah, to so, me, that, you know, we haven't got the answer. So, what are we? It's pointless getting the system in if. Well, if so, if, what we what we say in this in, in in that scenario is speak to your fire officer, and see what they say. If they're being difficult or they won't let you do anything, you can duct the system directly into a, into a space. Um, you can put it directly you, into a you've got two area. You answer the HMO officer and the fire officer. Yeah, so and they the, agree. So well, as long as so you could duct it into, let's say, if it was a front bedroom, you could tear it off and duct it into a front bedroom. And to please the fire officer, you can put a, a coil in it, so it's like a fire coil where it'll fill with foam if there's a problem with it. We've never had to go to that extent, but um, I, I understand it. It's, it, it creates a bit of a longer process than it needs to be. We'll just take one more question on this because we've got another speaker and Andrew will be here at the end as well. Uh, you touched on the humidifier. What do you think of the ones trapped over this? The, the cheap ones? The little pots yeah. there. So whatever's in them isn't on the walls, as obvious as that sounds, so, that, so, so it's good. But um, it depends on the size of the family. So normally you'll find that they, they collect about half a litre at the, at the very most. In a property with one person in it, you need to fill 60 a week to get rid of all the water. So you need to fill quite a lot of them. So um, it's a step forward, but probably a small step forward. It's better than nothing. 